we'll call that meeting to order. And first item is public comment. This is comment on anything for the Liquor Control Board. Seeing none, approval of the agenda. And move we approve the agenda. Second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Approval of the minutes from August. I move we approve the minutes from August. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? New business, uh, the Class 3 liquor license for the Black Crim Tavern. Class 3 liquor license is a license for uh, beverages other than um, wine and beer, which is all uh, currently an option at Black Crim Tavern. Uh, we have not had any problems related to drinking at Black Room Tavern, and the board would like we recommend that it approve the permit. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Staying. Other business? Staying none. Looking for adjournment? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So, so that one was two minutes. We have two minutes to select for it. <laughs> <laughs> that was last time. There's there. I know. I like that one. Minute. <laughs> we'll call to order the regular select board meeting. First up is public comment. This is comment on anything that's not on the agenda. I just have a quick. Um, Tamara Morgan from Kimball Library, um, and just wanted to let you guys know that um, our children's programs are going gangbusters. Uh, we've got nine public story hours on Wednesdays and Fridays, um, Legos on Wednesdays, uh, Magic the Gathering is a usual thing on Thursdays, our middle grade book club is happening. Um, there uh, was a fairy tale festival up at Killington that um, both our children's librarians created this enormous life-size candy land and schlepped it up to Killington. And from all reports um, from kids and from librarians, that was just pure joy, just amazing. It was a great day, it was nice out, um, lovely. Um, we're gonna be closed on Monday for Digital Secrets Day. Um, and the Programming, in terms of um, going forward, we try and we'd like to try and like form bridges between maybe the rep committee, um, the schools, uh, to try and bring the library into places where it isn't or where people don't think of going to the library. Um, we had some summer reading kids, some teenagers that have to read a book, you know, over the summer, and they came against their will, and uh, Courtney and Kate kind of listened to them, tried to figure out what they wanted, what they wanted to read, what the subject matter might be, and got them to read. They were very happy about it. Um, mostly what I'm saying is our children's librarians are amazing. Um, and also that we're uh, moving Kate's hours up to 15 hours, because the program that they have going on is just too much for, for one, and I think she was at five, maybe eight to ten hours. So now we'll do fifteen. And that's that's the report from the library. Thank you. Great, thanks. Yes. Got a question. Average number of participants in this children's program? Um <coughs> Kate said about forty a day. Great. Well a forty a, a session. Perfect. So yeah, lots of little ones. Glad to hear that. Yeah. It's been very, very popular. Thank you. Approval of the agenda. If I may ask the board to consider one change, um, I heard from Josh Jerome, our uh, economic development director, that he's working to potentially apply for what's called the Working Communities Challenge for the Boston Federal Reserve. Uh, this is a program that is similar to the R3 program. Um, except that it provides funding for uh, uh, consultants to work directly with towns and committees. Um, if the board would consider this, it would, I would ask that they could add Working Communities Challenge to the grant section. Sure. Thank you. 
see how much it is to the agenda. If not, any approval of it? So moved. Oh, look at that. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Here's consent calendar. <coughs> Public hearing minutes from August 8th. Minutes from September 10th, <coughs> October 1st, warrants and the cemetery class. Uh, move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Business restructuring of the Economic Development Council. We have here today uh, Peter Reed, who is the chair of the Economic Development Council. <coughs> He's been on the council for some time, and he has been working with Josh and several other members of the community to potentially restructure the, the council so that it uh, better provides for what right now has become. Well, thank you. Um, so um, I, don't, I don't know if you've got the right up. But did you distribute this at all? Though? It should uh, be yeah. in the okay. packet. Yeah. So there's sort of a brief write up of what we've been up to. Um, just a little bit of background. I think the I've been on the council for about three years, maybe a little more, and I've been chair for about two and a half. And in that time, and I think somewhat before that time, there was a feeling that we weren't really a very effective organization in, in moving economic development forward in town. And we had some good discussions, we bring people in, but we met once a month and there wasn't a lot of momentum. Uh, and going uh, back to the R3 process, I think there were two things that came out of that that sort of framed where we're heading with this. One was the need for an economic development director, which we've now achieved, not anything to do with economic development council in a big way, but I think something we were pushing consistently. So that, that made a huge difference in the way things operate in town. Um, the other one was the concern that there were a lot of economic development groups in town that didn't really coordinate, cooperate, or get along in any way. And we had a lot of wasted effort going on in, in this space. And there was a need to kind of pull those groups together in a better way. So the, uh, the outcome of that was to look at what we had going on in the Economic Development Council and try to expand out the, the population of people that were involved in it and bring in some of those other groups in a little more coordinated fashion. So for the last uh, three meetings or so, we've been doing that. So we've kind of maybe gotten a little ahead of our speakers here on this, this process. But I think it's been, it's been working well. The, the list of people that, that we've included is attached here, but I think we've been able to well, keeping the same group that was already there, uh, bring in uh, some new people from the private sector like Dan Bennett, um, bring in RACDC, the Chamber, Rasta, um, and uh, a few other people that, that I think uh, can really help to, to broaden the, the whole effort on economic development. The, the other thing is that we don't, we don't tend to be a group that know, makes big initiatives and takes votes and positions. Uh, I, I see it more as a, a coordinating committee and a, a place for people to, to push things along and, and share ideas. And I think now with Josh on board, it's a forum for him to discuss with, with business leaders in town um, what's going on and what he's doing and, and where we can help and where we can push things in a, in a more coordinated way. So that's, that's the way that we've been operating for a while. I think it is working. Uh, the, the other part of our, our ask is that given that we no longer get town funding, we're not really a, a town-driven committee. I'm, I'm looking at this more of a, as a private sector and, and uh, nonprofit coalition to move things forward, that uh, we're asking to remove ourselves as an official town committee, uh, which on the, on the one hand, alleviates the need for some of the, the blue sky laws and open meeting laws, which I don't think there's anything we're doing that's kind of hidden behind the, the curtains. We invite anybody to come to a meeting, uh, but it seems somewhat unnecessary at this point to, to go through that process. And uh, so we're, we're asking that, that piece. Um, and I think that also puts a little bit different spin on the, the tone of the committee, making it a little more private sector community driven rather than seen as a, an arm of the town, uh, for better or for worse. 
Uh, certainly, we, we will do anything we can to cooperate with town. Uh, Adolfo and I were just talking about a project that may involve a couple different pieces, one of them being the town, but uh, typically, I think the things we're doing are more uh, local businesses and, and helping groups work together on events and things like that. So that is our, uh, our proposal. Glad to take any questions or comments. One of the intents of the Economic Development Council was for them to look at policies the town could adopt that would help with barriers or different things the town could do to encourage economic development. If we do away with this council, are you guys proposing that that either come, how do the towns meet that piece? Because this is a whole chap, part of the whole chapter, Sonny's sitting here, right. in the, the town plan, and it was a huge effort that well, the, this the, group was identified. Well, I think the town, the town policies and, and maybe streamlining things is something that, that we, we've looked at a little bit. I don't think we've really gotten into it in a big way. I think the R3 group also has expressed some interest in working on that. Uh, and we had some initial meetings on that, involved Marty a little bit, and uh, it, I mean, obviously she's not here anymore, but we've, we've uh, uh, really haven't pushed much on that, but I think it is something that needs doing, and uh, would certainly be a, a, something that, that we could you know, take on as a, as a council and maybe involve some of the R3 resources that are still perking along um, to try to do that. It's, I, I think the, the challenge is maybe the, the time we might have uh, within the town government. I know everyone's a little stretched, and, and I think Josh is a resource on this potentially. Uh, we initially, when we looked at doing this about six or eight months ago, we thought, well, let's let Josh get his feet on the ground before we start you know, jigging around with policies. Uh, so maybe the time is, is right now since he's been in the job a while and has a little better sense of it. But I, I wouldn't want to let that go. So, <clears throat> see, now I've had a lot to do with this over the last 10 years. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> initially, when this conversation started 10 plus years ago, the concept was to have a person like Josh in his position and have an advisory committee, which pretty much is now what we have here on the list, that would work with that person. And so that was the original intent years ago, and it's been derailed and sidetracked and changed and moved all around. And it's kind of like we, now we've all come full circle here, and we're back to where the original concept started. So I'm not sure whether we, um, I don't know what the word is, on sanction or, <laughs> or, or remove the council, okay, or decertify or whatever. Um, I think that what's been going on for the last three plus years has been very positive, very productive. Um, it's, it's brought a lot of things together. The R3 process has been certainly instrumental in this. So I'm not quite sure we decommission you, I guess would be the word. But um, I'm kind of thinking that initially when this all happened was that that a group of folks would kind of work with the economic development director. So I don't know quite how we get there, but this was the concept, you know, years ago is, okay, let's pick a bunch of people from different organizations. We now have that list here. So how do we keep them in play um, and, and move this process forward? Because I think it's working now. I, I think it is. I think the one thing I'll say for Josh is he's reached out to everybody on this list probably Absolutely. by now and has built his own relationships with them. So I think he's getting the advice that way. But uh, well, he, now he's got you know ten years or fifteen years right. here with his, their ear to the ground, so that he can kind of you know, hey, what's going on at the Ethan Allen building, or what is going on here, or does this person need some assistance because they're starting a new business? So he's <clears throat> those ears are very important. What's the negative to it being attached to the town other than you've got to get your agenda out and well, follow the open Yeah, I mean, there, there's that part of it, but I think the, you know, the, we've, we've basically gone out to six or eight people that weren't on the council before and said, hey, come and join us and, and work on this process with us. And I think the, you know, what I've seen for the, from the Arts and Culture Committee, for example, starting that, it involves some overhead that, that to me is, is, is not really helpful. <laughs> to be honest, uh, and, and it's the chair, and we don't really have a secretary. I'm the one that kind of does it and uh, uh, get the, the friendly reminders. So if there was some administrative help, yeah. maybe? Yeah, maybe. I, I don't know if that's uh, 
So there, there's that part of it. I think part of it also is the maybe the perception angle, but I, I don't know if that's as big a deal. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I, th this was kind of the, the sense of where we wanted to go, but I don't think it's something that uh, is a make or break thing or, <coughs> you know, fleeing the, the area. Um, so if, if, you know, if you're more comfortable having us stay under the, the auspices of the town and are okay with having 15 people on this rather than seven, um, I think we'd have to deal with, um, you know, the process for new members and things like that. Right, term limits little, and those kind of things. A little more ad hoc um, in the group in the last, you know, four, five, six months. Because um, we, I, I think after a while you kind of know the people that are interested in doing this and have the right connection. You grab them and say, come sit down with us. Um, I don't think we necessarily need the select board to give the, you know, the, the review and blessing of those people, but that's just my opinion. But we talked about this some too when we were talking with Tom about his committee is the, the membership that's mm -hmm. recognized as one thing, but then you have people that are interested in, and can still and participate without right. being officially. I mean, but the, the official membership to me is sort of an artificial thing. It doesn't, right. it, it doesn't add anything to the equation. You're not vetting these people. You're just making sure that you know, you're not having some crazy person maybe jump into the committee. But I, I think the committee itself, the council, is perfectly able to go out and identify the right people and pull them in. Well, that or, changes too, right? Depending on what your topic is or what right. you're working on, that may more different. And we've had pretty good participation so far. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, the other it's, problem with the council, initially we, were, you know, we had a couple members that weren't coming very regularly. We were, you know, it was, it was kind of flagging in terms of energy. So having a bigger group of people, it, and I think you see everyone at the table, and you're like, well, I better show up because something might happen, and I'll miss out. So I think that's exactly what's happening. Yeah, it's a little bit of the peer pressure. <clears throat> so, how do we deal with that? Because this is working. This is really working. I, I've seen it. You know, it's it's moving towards this this goal of, you know, a lot of community involvement, so I don't want to derail it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I certainly hate to stand in the way of something which is gaining momentum. I mean, it brings up really kind of an interesting question of, you know, for town committees in general, like, where is it important for a committee to be officially a part of town government, and where is it, does it make sense for it to not be? And I'm not sure we've ever really had that discussion, and, um, you know, if, if there's if there's really good reasons for this council to be attached to the government, I, I'd be good to know. Um, that doesn't sound like we're really coming up. But with, a couple things that with, I, I saw as determinants. One would be, you're, are you getting funding or not? And that we're not. Mm -hmm. And the other one is, uh, are you are you making decisions on behalf of the town that are in some way binding? Which I don't know if that happens in other committees, but at least things come back to the select board, but there's a there's sort of a, an agreement reached at a committee that then comes back. And we're not, you know, we're really not doing that. We're just trying to right. just foster the communication more than anything else. Yeah. I think there's two different things going on here, though. Right? So you, you have your group that's working on different projects that are not really connected to what the original intent of that committee was. Mm -hmm. So you've taken a committee that's original intent was to look at policies that we needed in the town, people that we needed to connect, what, you know, where does the where is the town willing to make an investment in infrastructure or in grants to help, like we did with LED Dynamics and whatnot, and it's, what's happened is the, the more appealing stuff to work on, for lack of a better term, <laughs> is what you guys are working on, so the committee's all kind of gotten this way, but we're still sitting over here knowing that there are things that we could be doing that might make it better, you know, how do we determine where we put our investment in expanding water and sewer or, you know, those type of things. And those aren't the fun things right. all the time. And you guys have kind of moved. So there's almost still that need, which I think is part of town government, which is when are we willing to step in and apply for a grant and when are, you know, what does it look like for, you know, is there, should we have a more defined policy on uh, tax abatement, for example, and, and some of those type of things. And that's what that group was originally part of their charge. Right. Yeah, but but I'm not sure events. the group ever knew the what group, their charge was. Well, the group well, never did that. Uh, I mean, they never it, did it. It was, it, I think, might have been part of the original 
push, but it, it never happened. So. Never that that piece of that didn't really evolve. But we still need it. <coughs> we still need it, and that's the group that would be working on it. So when we talk about what's the so what is that we it? need. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it, and I think you have a but you have a great group of people here that could probably be charged with that task, mm -hmm. and get some input back to us right. about those kind of things that we need. So it's our responsibility to give you guys the direction that, yeah, that would, you need that to work be, on. That would be helpful because I don't. I mean, since I've been on the committee, we've never gotten anything back saying, "Hey, we got this issue. Could you help us with this?" Right. Maybe it was implied in the charter, and you thought Correct. it was happening. But if there's specific things that the select board of the town office thinks we can help with, you know, we're glad to look at it and take it on. I mean, we're dealing with volunteer labor here, so there's yeah, a limit. Like every other committee. <laughs> uh, and most of us. Yeah. <laughs> we do get some kind of paycheck, don't we? <laughs> minimal. Very minimal. <laughs> okay. Um, well, but maybe it's a... We could also say that from the town perspective, Josh could be tasked with those and he could look to this group to help him with it. I mean, yes. it, it could be set up any mm -hmm. different way, but I don't know that being <coughs> an official town committee versus not kind of really any difference in it. Although there are some town functions that we still need right. to achieve there somewhere. In, in that. So do we treat this like the arts? Council situation, you know, do we do we care how many members we actually have here? We have a lot of community engagement here. We don't Eight accept that we want to make sure that we don't leave them in a position where they can't ever do anything because they don't have a quorum. Correct. So that's a... Uh, well, we don't necessarily need a quorum because we never make any decisions, so it's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're advisory. I mean, we, we really don't take votes on anything. No, I know, and we don't. So, so, so I mean, we, we agree on things that yeah. we should all be behind. And we have talked about a lot of things that are, you know, part of the whole process to move the community forward. So um, I'm, I'm not in favor of disbanding you. I'm sorry. You're going to have okay. to still break your warnings. <laughs> right. stay, it is post your agenda. But I think it's fair for you to want from us a charge statement. Yeah. Okay. And... And I think we can do that through Josh, don't you think? I think you, that we can, um, and maybe what we do is we try to draft that and then get it to you guys to review, comment on, and whatnot, and bring it back here okay. for next month on those areas, because I think Sonny's group should have a set kind of be some input in it too. And, so yeah, Josh could be. A, sort of I mean, it's a good conduit for that. Good liaison between, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, Delphi's working on the chairs committee stuff here, and so I mean, there's a lot of collaboration I think happening within different organizations now. So this is another another piece of that puzzle, I think. So. So if we stay as an official town committee, are you okay with us having a more fluid group of people? You know, yeah. What we can do is when we do the chart, the, I'll send you a draft of some of the things <coughs> that we've done okay. so you can see kind of what it's like and then we can put one together for you okay. guys and then it says how many members and we'll just adjust that number. Right. The good news is I think it's moving and it's it is. working. So it's working. That's, uh, so. Now, if we could only get that enthusiasm for the listeners about this, Peter. Peter, the other, you know, the other part of it is that if, even as a town committee or council, um, anybody can show up and work on and work on it, whether they're an official member or not. Right. So, it's and and if you're never taking a vote on anything, it really actually doesn't really matter, right? People are welcome to show up and they're welcome to help. And it's true. Whether they have some sort of official status is what really a formality, yeah. right? You need to get yourself a secretary who can take the minutes. <laughs> uh, now that we have 15 people, maybe you can. Maybe uh, you can. That. That's, that's our next meeting. <laughs> that's what I'm getting here. You're just trying to get out of that part of this. Now, well, we're trying to adjust also to get yeah. change our meeting date so Josh can. Yes, so, so Josh can be involved. Right. I think that's a tough time for him, so we're, we're working on that as well. Peter, the only other thing, uh, just a quick question. I saw our recreation, financial education, medical representatives. The only one, and this is selfish. Is there anybody from industry, technology? Currently, no, but I, I'm, I would love to have somebody from any of the companies on Beanville Road or yeah. anywhere else to, to join in. 
if you if you no. have suggestions. Yeah. I'm not asking you to be <laughs> Bill, Bill, Bill may want to. <laughs> and, and, and we have talked to Bill on a regular basis about different things. And, okay. And, uh, yeah, Bill's been engaged. Yeah, when we were doing sur business surveys. And, so. One one nice thing that you could do, I think, maybe for for all of the select board, would be as you have your meetings um, and you and you start and you get your agendas together, would just to be to put us on your email list, okay. just so that we know when you're meeting and what you're going to be talking about, and if there's something on there that one of us is like, oh, I have some real input for that, or I just like to know more about what's going on there, then we know something about what you're doing. And we can, I will come and listen. That. Yeah, and Adolfo okay. comes pretty regularly. To me. Fragment from his office, so it works out okay. <laughs> you know, I appreciate that. Great. Okay, I'll do that. All right, thanks, thanks, Peter. Thank you. Assembly permit for the safe and scene Halloween event. So, last year uh, we made a switch to the safe and scene event, uh, and the switch was that um, town staff decided to close down Main Street to make it more of a pedestrian friendly, just make it so that the kids and the families can walk from one side or the other. Um, it was somewhat successful, and then I think uh, participants were a little confused, and some went on the street, but mostly they walked out on the sidewalks. Um, I think towards the end, people began to become accustomed to the fact that cars were not gonna come out, and they really started enjoying the being on the road and more of a novelty stuff. Uh, the rec department decided and the coordinator of the event decided to continue with that same tradition this year. And so this permit reflects the fact that uh, the road would be closed from 4 to 6 p.m., which will allow children and families to meander along the road. Um, barricades would be placed on either side. Um, and uh, safety, again, is, is a uh, paramount concern. And we will make sure that, although this, the sheriff's department has not yet signed, the permit itself, but uh, they would be a part of it. Oh, they have? Oh, okay, so I'm sorry. The, the version that's in your packets does not include the Sheriff's Department signature, but they have already it's on the back. On the back. Yeah. Oh, so the only signature that we're missing is the health officer signature. Well, we'll no, we have the health officer signature. No, actually, the we don't have the help the police department. The police department signed under the health officer. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, actually. okay. Look at that. All right, mistake there. You can just like copy and paste, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we did hear a lot of public uh, positive response from last year's event compared to the prior year's event. I think people just, it was something new that they hadn't yeah. seen about the road closure and they, they appreciated it. It's so. gaining momentum. Mm -hmm. The sheriff is asking if you're gonna have detour signs in your comment. We're, we're going to coordinate with RACDC, who's um, a partner on the event, and then also with the highway department. So. And the detour route is essentially just travel down Pleasant Street, and if anyone needs to continue down uh, uh, South Main Street, they could turn right onto um, uh, Railroad Street and then turn left back onto South Main Street. Or as an alternative, they could also turn right on uh, School Street head down Summer Street and then continue on Salisbury Square. Pretty simple. Mm -hmm. Pretty easy. Stop at a house on, on Summer Street, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll be out there waving. <laughs> Get off my lawn. <laughs> All right. Any issues? We're handling uh, dental supplies. <laughs> okay. Well, hey, what's wrong with that? You got all that sugar, you got to brush your teeth, right? Okay. All right. I'll make a motion That's to... the house that gets egg later. Oh, okay. All right. I'll make a motion to approve the assembly permit for safety and scene Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion series. Official legal action, 330 Hebbard Hill. Uh, this is more of a, a briefing and if the board would be interested in entertaining a request, uh, also a request. We have continued with notices to both properties uh, regarding the condition of, of well, the property itself. Um, 330 Hebert Hill, um, a representative of the property, did visit my office as soon as he received the initial notice. I explained to them why they had received the notice. 
Uh, I also explained to them the appeal periods. Um, they commented to me verbally that they would appeal, but the town never actually received an appeal. So uh, according to our attorney, not curing the issue within seven days and or appealing the decision within 15 days makes the violation an official violation. And so because it's been greater than 15 days, the town now has the option of continuing with this property to court to force the property owner to continue to clean the property. Um, the town has not been invited to visit the property to point out the issues that exist. Um, so if the board would, would, would like at this point, they could authorize me to speak with our attorney and then continue with the legal, legal action. So have you been up there recently? I've driven by it. I know that they, they, they have made some... They've made significant progress mm -hmm. compared to what it is, was. I also they know that... They moved it all out back, but it's... Yeah. You know, they, they, they have made progress. <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it is. It's it's 90% better than it was. Okay. I heard that. <laughs> so I didn't know where it went. <laughs> I also worked on School Street. Why not do it there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it, it's a, it really, you know, it's, it's up to the, the board. We could we could wait another month to see if they continue to clean, but I, I feel it is a part of a pattern where yeah. something is done and then it comes back and then something is done. I do know that one weekend I drove through the property just to make sure that something was happening, and I, I saw that there was an ongoing fire. I saw the smoke. I reported to the fire warden, who then shared with me that there was no burn permit. Uh, there was a visit to the property. They didn't confirm that there was a fire, but could smell that a fire had occurred at some point, somewhere. Uh, so, right, you know, they're, they may be trying, and I, I think that could have been a part of the trying. So. Yeah, so I know they weren't burning anything illegal because I went and checked several mm -hmm. times. Um, and then the first two weekends, they did have a permit for it. I don't know which, so I don't know if it, it must have expired when you checked. Yeah. Me personally, this part. I mean, I drive by it every day, and you know, I there's no garbage anymore. They've taken care of the dumpster, and they had garbage bags just piled up there, and it's not there anymore. So, it, it, to me, it appears that they're actually making effort. I mean, I don't know if they're continue, you know, how far they're continue or whatever, but it's definitely more progress than okay. what I've seen in the last ten years. If if it could help the board, uh, something to say about the, the following property. Could maybe help the board with a decision on the 330 Hebert Hill Road property. Um, the town realized that we had sent uh, the initial notice violation letter to 10 Dudley Street to an address that was registered with the Lister's office. However, that address is different from what is with our water wastewater department. So the letter sent to the address list uh, recorded with the Lister's office, that letter was returned back to the town as non deliverable. So our attorney indicated that the best course that he would suggest is that we restart the, the notice process because these are the type of technicalities that would cause the town to potentially lose in court because we didn't send the notice to the right address. So if we restart the process for 10 Dudley Street in terms of the notice of violation, it would give us an additional month for the property on, on Hebert Hill to see if they continue with the progress. It gives us more time for the board to, to see if more changes happened or if it's gotten worse over the next 30 days. Um, so we could. Are they making any progress whatsoever? Or are no. they still going the wrong way on Dudley Street? Oh, Dudley's, Dudley's no progress nothing. at all. Nothing's Dudley. changed. Because I know last time they'd added to it versus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's more noticeable now because the vegetation has died. So yeah. now we could see more. Um, I don't believe any more has been added, but that's because I don't think we can really add any more. Um, it's. Except higher. Go up. <laughs> yeah, you could have go up. Um, I do know that the Department of Environment and Conservation has added the property to a list called the SMAC list, which means that they recognize there's a problem, they just won't do anything with it until they have time to okay. go back to the property. Okay. They are willing to take the town's lead, and if we continue with the property, they will come back again. But no progress has been made. The only issue there is that we sent the initial notice of violation to what could be an incorrect address. Okay. My preference would be to wait on the Hebert Hill one, especially if they've made as much progress as they have. I'd go one, letter, one step further and send them a letter of encouragement. Thank you. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're doing a good job. Yeah, Continue to move forward. I think that's actually a really nice, would be a nice idea. And so, so you I know, we... 
to uh, to me, it's not about the money, right? It's about it's about getting it cleaned. It's up. about getting and, it cleaned up. Yeah. So you know, and they've made progress and significant progress. It wasn't like they just picked up one corner. They really they I heard I hadn't been by it, but I heard yeah, that they were making it's different. I got some emails from some of your neighbors up there that thought I they, things were moving well. It's probably so, father in law. So yeah, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> probably so yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, kind of like, okay, start the process over with Dudley Street, get the right address, and with them, I'd say, hey, you keep on moving. You're doing a good job. You're, I think you're going to be okay if you get this taken care of. So, would you agree? Yeah, I, I like that idea of the letter of encouragement. I think that's recognition is good. Yep. Okay. Good to know. Whether you're going to pat them on the back, you know, just... Not yeah, quite, but just say we're doing, yeah, <laughs> keep on making progress. Come <laughs> Gonna save yourself that fine here. I give you the action you need. Yep. Is that where you want to go? Okay. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Um, next up is budget committee discussion. Turn this one over to you, Pat. This was your request. Budget committee. You wanted to talk about giving <clears throat> direction to the budget committee and about adopting a livable wage. Oh, okay. You're talking about what our priorities might be in the budget, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things I would like us to look at is see what we're paying people now and what it would cost to bring that up to a livable wage. It's one of the things I'm interested in. I don't, I don't know if there are other people interested or not. But. I'd like to see data around that. It would be really helpful. It's, it may not cost us that much if we decided to do it, but What's I think it's... What's a livable page? Well, they usually figure about $15 dollars an hour. Where does that number come from? Who picked that number? I don't know. How do you know it's livable? Is that livable wage? I mean, it's all by definition. I can have one person who has a standard that is higher or lower. I think but that's when, generally what people talk about as a livable wage. So when you we talk can look about at that too. what it takes to get to whatever the definition of livable wage is, are you looking at all the impacts of that? What are you, what are you, ta are you talking about looking at what the all the different all the different areas that that's going to impact for the budget or in I think you'd have to in the end if it's something you wanted to do and so is that a budget committee exercise um, they seem to develop the budget right I think in action given the information that's probably more of a cliff exercise but who's paid what and how much it would change what do you do if you say your livable wage is 15 and I'm a seven year employee and I'm at 1501? You wouldn't go down, but you'd have to decide what would happen. Yeah, I'd have to be part well, of the I mean, where do you? You'd have to be part of the conversation. This is a pretty lengthy conversation. Yeah, yeah this, I mean, this is, no, this is not a light issue. This is no, a pretty this meaty is issue. It's a pretty serious sure. issue. And so, <clears throat> So there's a lot of definitions I need here. And who qualifies for this living wage are we talking about? You know, you're talking town employees. You know, I've had numerous discussions with people at the state house about this, and you know, no one yet has told me that, you know, are we paying high school kids this living wage? You know, are we talking about high school and college kids here? Because I can't get an answer yet. You know, and all I keep hearing is is, you know, the constant rhetoric is, well, you know, all these companies are coming into Vermont, you know, Walmart and Home Depot and all these companies, and they're coming here and they're paying minimum wage. Well, Vermont has the right to set a minimum wage law. I'm not sure that this livable wage thing and this minimum wage thing are tied together. I'm still finding trying to figure out what it is. So, as a business owner, you know, if we're going to say $15 minimum wage, that means I pay high school kids coming through the door 15 bucks an hour because I'm not doing it. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, but that's not going to happen. Okay, because high school kids that come to work for me are entry level employees, and therefore I think they should be entry level in pay scale. So, you know, I'm still waiting for the definition of how this all plays out. So, 
Well, this is just what I'm interested in is something just for the town, so it wouldn't affect but you. But you got to define that. But you got to, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, who, who qualifies for this? What, what's the qualification? And, and do we have employees now who are below that level that you're talking about? I don't know. I have no idea. That's why I So was it's like, you know, I can dig through this, and I think it's a perfect example. I think you're right. We need more data. And I think, that, you know, if this is something that we want to pursue, then, you know, this is Cliff's job to kind of put this together for us. I can say that uh, most of the most of the staff members that would fall under the uh, the, the supposed fifteen dollar wage below are summer high school employees that uh, you know are volunteer not volunteers but um, work at the pool on the right. camps. Um, the other group that does fall under this category is our volunteer firefighters. They are paid you know a much lower rate because you know it's it, I, I think their firefighters are ten. 73 an hour. But if you're going to say our skill level, right? So right. now you're into that whole discussion of <clears throat> if you were looking at the the high school student looking to help out at summer camp mm -hmm. versus a firefighter who's dedicated 30 years yeah. or you know 10 years, 15 years, whatever, to and the skills and the training and all that, you know, it's yeah. it's not an easy discussion because if I've been here for and worked my way up. And I'm now paid fifteen oh one. I'm going to be pissed yeah. if somebody comes in through the door with no experience, no anything, and gets paid fifteen. Yeah. So I'm not worth a penny more than somebody you've got to invest a huge amount of resources yeah. in to train. It may it may so create gonna, challenges for us if it's going to move up a scale. Yeah, if it would it would be a bump up a scale for all the firefighters and well for everybody and for everyone. So we're not a volunteer fire department anymore. We don't have volunteer fire departments. We're not. That's part not a part of the equation. And it's volunteer if you want to be on the fire department. Is that what it is? Well, it's all, <laughs> as long as I, I've been on. It's volunteer paid call. I see. Right. Okay. That's what it's been. Okay. Well, I'm just asking the. And question. I don't know when it made that switch. I've been <laughs> yeah, I, I'm waiting just for my time. curious, and it's how it kind of works. It was. The switch was made when the interpretation was that it had to be, they had to be paid when they were there to be covered by workers' Workers' comp, comp is what my understanding was. And so you, you don't get paid as a, you get paid for the hour, for when you're there, and then it's not even for the full time you're there. Right? No. Meetings or it's, trainings, it's, you get an hour, and you might be there for. Well, right? even calls. Right? We so. get toned out, we get back, to, and as soon as we clear, we're off the clock, even though we may have two, three hours of clean up. Clean up. No, we do. But that's so, that was the workman's so we could fix. We could probably we could spend a lot of time talking about it, but yeah. I don't think that's the point of this discussion here. I, I think really what I think it would, it, it's it's not. Um, I think it's reasonable to for us to be able to say as a town that we are proud of the wages that we pay our employees and that we feel good about it that they are paid a livable, dignified, whatever you want to call it, wage, fair wage, and. It would be nice to, for us to be able to know that for sure, that we're really doing that. If, we're, if we are doing that right now, if we feel like we're really feeling good about the way we compensate the people who work for the town, then great. But having a process that we go through, we might identify places where maybe we're not doing that, and that would be a net benefit to the town. And exactly how that would play out, it could be very complicated. It could be really hard to make decisions about it. It doesn't mean that we don't go down that road and just at least take an initial look at like, well, what do we really have going on? And are we doing the right thing? And it could have repercussions. And we might decide, yeah, in an ideal world, we'd like to pay everybody this. But for our budget, that's just not going to happen. And so we compromise. That's you know, the world. We live in a world of compromise. But we, if we at least make that effort and people feel like they're being, being, fairly tra being treated fairly, it's hard to see, though. It would be much of a downside to yeah, doing that exploration. I agree. So to me, I think. Before, I mean, it sounds like a lot, I agree, lengthy discussion, deep dive, right? But maybe there's just an initial check. One, what is, quote, livable wage, What if it is a 15 grade? And then, is there really an impact to the town? Mm -hmm. Right? You know, how many fall below that line? And if it's really? all kids, not kids, young people working at our camp, <clears throat> is there any other process that has to go after that? Mm -hmm. Or not? Yeah. With the exception of our summer youth, we typically, the way we would typically qu uh, calculate hourly rate is uh, adding benefits. And yeah, uh, I was going to say, then there's the whole benefit program here. Yeah, all of our employees, when we count the benefits that are available to them and their hourly <coughs> wage, are, they far exceed the $15 per hour. 
uh, because the town contributes for their health care, retirement, and everything else. So, Vacation. Yeah, if we were to take that into consideration, um, all of our employees are far above mm -hmm. uh, already the $15 an hour. When we count what the town pays out of tax um, revenue. Sure, and that's, and that's part benefits. of the conversation. Yeah. So. And the IRS counts it. Because mm -hmm. if you get a gift, you know, technically you're, you know, you get a Christmas bonus, you're going to get that's counted into that. So, yeah. so I'm just telling you, it's like I think we're already there. Okay, Can it's my opinion. But I would love to see the data. <laughs> Is that a motion? I'm agreeing with you. I think we just need to look and say, hey, yeah, we're doing. I'd love to be able to tell somebody who I run into on the street, are we doing right by the people who work for the town? Have to be able to look yeah. them in the eye and say, yeah, we're doing a really yeah, good job. Yeah, exactly. That. So yeah, I'd love to have that. I don't know because I don't know the answer. Well, yeah. If you said. And We've sat through the union negotiations. Well, I, yeah, well, you know, I was, wasn't going to go there, but yes, that's... Well, but they, we did comparisons, mm -hmm. right? And we righted mm -hmm. it, the contract prior to this one, we went through a whole graduated scale on the highway folks yeah. and on the water wastewater folks to bring them up to peer. Yeah, so maybe that would, be, so that would be great information to share with the rest of us. Yeah, I don't know. I threw all that stuff away when the contract was <laughs> but, but you have the somewhere. data. Cliff's got it all. I do. If, if the board would like at the next uh, <coughs> briefing from the finance director, I could ask him to focus on on uh, the Smaller hourly wage, like yeah. either an average or you know, without names of employees, and not violate any any laws, just to say, right? These are the, the the wages, and although all that stuff is public information, isn't it? The wage paid is the paid, the, yeah. the actual dollar value is. Um, but the, some of the deductions aren't, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so it gets sticky. Like if you have uh, child support or a court order withholding sure. or all that, none of that, you sure. can't publish sure. any of that data, but you but can just publish the work. rate and the... Their hourly course. rate, their benefit package, that's all public, yeah. so you Next, can share that. Yeah. We can have that. I think it's a bar graph. There's a line that, that's whatever the livable wage is, mm -hmm. and then there's a graph that shows. Exactly. Above it's and below. It's a bar chart. <laughs> it's an easy one. Yeah, yeah. There doesn't, there certainly doesn't have to be names associated with any No, we don't have to put any names. Yeah. I, I could certainly ask Cliff pictures. to do that. Pictures and bring it to the board for his next briefing. Okay. I'd like to see it. You would. I wanted to sure. do Could something on other on priorities, issuing priorities from the select board to the budget committee. I was questioning whether you'd done that in the past. Do you give them any direction? Or just say go at it. Well, the, the budget well, committee doesn't actually us. doesn't report to the select board. But they come up with a budget, right? Um, yeah, in which they ask well, us they, to approve. <laughs> they don't really come up with it so much as they provide oversight. For the budget process, right? I don't say it, and then they help develop the first draft of the budget, whatnot, that then comes to us. But the interesting part is they know they've never presented it to us. They develop their budget, and then the town manager brings it to the select board. The budget committee's never brought it to the select board. But the selectmen are still responsible for it. We're responsible for the budget, but mm. we don't have to take their budget. No. Right. I mean, it's an odd process. One of, their, one of their requirements per per the their charter as created at a town meeting, I think it was 1996, was that the committee was to present, as Trini mentioned, their budget to the select board. And over the last, at least under my tenure, there, there was some contentious uh, conversation about them coming to the board and actually presenting. Um, at some point, it became that they would choose to communicate to the board as opposed to have a formal presentation, PowerPoint, or whatever it is, because it was very vague. The, their charge was very vague. So um, I think now we're in a different place. Um, but I would like to remind the board they are, they are elected officials. Um, and the select board can, can make a request, just like they could make a request to the select board, but they are duly elected and independent from from town oversight, other than the voters. So the budget committee the, is is in, is a a body that exists by virtue of a town vote that created it. It's mm -hmm. not okay. Because I was under the impression that it was um and on the floor vote. Oh. Not yeah. yeah. But that's as, how it was created was, yeah. in so many years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind um, of as an oversight. I, I didn't know that. I've sat on the committee. I mean, basically, what we've done is you know you get together once a month and you take the current budget and you take the current 
expenditures for the year and you're just kind of looking and you were tracking it's like okay you know are we in place and but truthfully it was basically run by the financial manager so the budget committee made many recommendations going forward for to another into another year putting together what they thought should be worked on and, and so i sat on there with a couple other folks and we thought you know we were going to try to figure out how can we save money at the town garages on heating oil and stuff like that and you know those were pretty much just discounted conversations so I didn't serve along and was, wasn't happy. So it didn't feel to me like we were really accomplishing anything. Mm -hmm. So that's my take on it. But it was created by the voters and so there it is. Any more discussion on budget? So can I just say, so it sounds like the result is they just come up with a budget? What we did when I was on there was we reviewed numbers on a monthly basis to see how close we were tr to tracking what that year's budget was. So if we saw something that was slightly out of whack, you know, we needed an explanation for that. So if something's tracking, you know, 50, 60 percent higher than what it was actually budgeted for, what's the reason? And so that's kind of what we did. And then towards the end of this year, you know, we were charged with, okay, so now where can we, you know, where are we going to fix? What can we, is there places where we can save? And, you know, truthfully, it was like, you know, we were talking about fuel oil for the garages. You know, do mm -hmm. we, what's the contract? You know, are we able to buy it at a better rate? Um, but the conversation really, when it came down to it, was done by the finance manager who presented it to the town manager who presented it to the select board. So the budget committee was basically more of an oversight to make sure that things didn't look out of skew. But, you know, it depends on, you know, if you've got an active financial manager, I'm really not sure why we need a budget committee. But it's there, so. The reason I'm asking is because we are responsible for it in the end. Yes. So I'm wondering, is there a process? And it sounds like there is a process. It was basically reviewing what was going on on a monthly basis. Well, they do work with Cliff and yeah. Adolfo when they're putting the budget together. They, they all sit around together and give feedback back and forth, and that's what produces that first draft that the select board works with. And there was also interaction with the capital planning committee. So capital planning committee is looking at projects, you know, where does that fit in the budget? You know, what have we got that we've, you know, did we pay off a bond? Can we take on another one? You know, what are we going to fix? Are we going to do this road? Yeah, so those are, those are things that were discussed. to develop the budget. The board would like, I could also ask Cliff to share more of his participation with his short time with the town, with the budget committee. I know that um, we have new members on the committee, or at least a new member that's, that's uh, become very engaged in the process. So mm -hmm. I could have Cliff uh, share from his perspective uh, his involvement with the budget committee over the last well, since March of earlier this year. He had a different makeup now than what it was five, six years ago, yeah. too. So, you know, it's, it's you know, a different financial manager so, and different folks. So it may be, you know, that it's the process is working better now. I don't know. It'd be good to get Cliff, Cliff's take on it. Yeah, absolutely. Any more comments, questions, concerns? Moving on, grants, working community challenge grants. Well, the application for the working communities challenge is not due until December, but a letter of intent is due uh, in early November. Um, we are hoping to have very least a, a, a vote by the select board so that it will strengthen our letter of intent to apply for the grant when well, we do finally submit it um, because the letter is due before the next select board meeting. Uh, we are hoping to engage with our neighbor towns, uh, I believe Brookfield, Braintree, and a few other towns that we're hoping to create uh, a more regional group which would strengthen our application. Uh, we have been working with the R3 chairs committee who is very interested in seeing this go forward. Um, we have engaged uh, Brookfield, we have engaged other towns, uh, and they all seem very interested in joining Randolph in this process. So 
Um, we're open to have that letter of intent uh, completed by Josh um, by the deadline, which is early November. And you know, again, that, that won't lock us into applying. We could always come back to the select board before the November meeting and say, this is what we've done. This is, these are the towns that have um, also voted to be a part of this group. And if we move forward, then we're all applying as one, as opposed to individual towns. I'm going to add a little bit to that because I've said on part of this. So this was um, um, a program that's put together by the Boston Fed. There was a presentation held here, I think it was July, where they came to right. present. Yep. And so um, what it is, it's uh, their way of trying to figure out how to engage and move communities forward. One of the challenges is, is you have to be a community over 5,000, which we're not, but they don't care if you cross town lines. So, um, and the monies, this first phase is for a planning grant, correct? That's right. The yep. first phase is a planning grant, and then if you're successful, once you submit your application through the planning grant, then what's available out there was, I believe it was three, three years of approximately $100,000 a year mm -hmm. if you receive this. So one of the things that was talked about in this meeting in July was you know what are the needs of the community and where would this money really be beneficial and so one of the things that we touched on was the need for child care within the entire region so we've had those discussions with Damien so this was possibly a way to make that a big bigger focus and, and move that child care piece along farther and faster so we think that's a really has a really good potential to be able to score some good points mm -hmm. And so engaging Braintree and Brookfield, and then possibly it could even be broader. Um, because we're an opportunity zone, we might be looked at a little bit more favorably. So those are some things that we were kicking around. So I think it's, I think it's got some, some potential. And um, you reached out to somebody in Brookfield? Uh, yes, we had the select board chair in Brookfield. Okay. Uh, at any and one of I had contacted, Josh had asked me to contact Megan and Braintree, so I reached out to her, and so I got her to chat, and so Josh is supposed to be reaching out to her to get Braintree engaged in this, because that seems to be a very common problem throughout the entire state is the child care issue. So we thought, if we're a, a core community here, maybe we could score some help in the child care department. So that's my part of it. Um. We, you know, it would be helpful to have a vote from the select board to authorize us to submit a letter of intent. Does, doesn't necessarily have to be a, a vote to authorize the town to apply for the grant, but, um, or it could just authorize me to, without a vote, just to s submit a letter of intent. So, if you, oh, why would we want to use? Authorize you to submit a letter of intent, but not necessarily authorize you to apply for the grant. Like, just it's given options. Maybe I'm just complicating <laughs> things. <laughs> Is there, are there other? Are there, are there, there are two any, different phases of the application right. process? Right. But is there anything like there are any issues that we should be considering that would stop us from saying, "Well, just we authorize you to go ahead and How apply much for is the, grant. the grant." What's the match requirement? Who's making the match? If it's the regional folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's some things they got to iron out. Right. In there's the location. Some, a letter of intent gets you down the next phase of this, so then we can get some more information to move the process forward. Who are the partners? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, because yeah, we don't know who the partners are. The partners, oh, yeah. you know, there was a broad range. You could incorporate Braintree, Brookfield, Randolph, uh, Bethel, Royalton. You know, there's, it could be a, a regional thing. Chelsea. So, mm -hmm. a lot of people from Chelsea yeah. come over this way. So, but how much money is it? How yeah. much can you get in a planning grant? Yeah, Five well, thousand? I think it was ten grand. Was yeah, it? Was there, planning grant was ten. Yeah, there. It, I think it's more than that, but it's split up by the number of groups that actually involved. apply. Communities involved. So it would be considerable, but you know the, the total amount we don't know yet. The RFP was just released, so we're still trying to make sure that one we can meet the requirements for having the population for the for the application, and two that we make it as attractive enough to obtain as much funding as possible. So. Well, and have it be a successful project. Exactly. Yeah. So you, want the, you said it would be stronger if the board voted? 
to it would authorize be, the letter of intent? It would be because then we could we could we could submit it with minutes from the meeting to say that the board voted to authorize us to X. So. Anybody want to make a motion? Sure, I'll move that we authorize Adolfo to sign a letter of intent for this planning grant. Second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Old business. Wind River Sludge Disposal Payment Dispute. So we, there's some more information. I spent some time with uh, Cliff this week looking at some of these numbers and trying to get our heads around how to do it. There's a spreadsheet that came out of that effort. So I think there's a, you know, we got some, of, some more of the information that we asked for, which is starting to make the picture clearer. And I think the, or the original invoice that went to Wind River for the 24,000 and change then once the numbers got crunched a little better, that number has been backed down to the 17,900. And that's not for many of the work that we did this week. That was just part of the process. So we're talking about 19, the, the so they, they were invoiced the 24,000, they paid it. Mm -hmm. That number then was <coughs> sharpened some and the, the value is the 17,900. Right. And the variables that we're dealing with here are a little bit hard, right? Because we don't have a way of saying the volume that came into the process that was generated by the town use is X, and the additional that came in by Wind River is Y. Because we don't know what, what those two values, we know how much they brought, but we don't know how much it resulted in in the costs and whatnot. The other problem we have is some of these costs are what we call soft costs, which are employee costs, and which we would have had anyway. So what we did was we looked at the 2018 values as compared to the 2019 values, knowing that we don't really know that, you know, there's, what well, we do, we know that it's probably not true that 100, that the number is exactly the same. We know there's some variable there. We just don't know what it is because um, we've had some new people hook on. We've had, you know, houses change, vacant. There's a whole variety of things. What we know is that in the end of all this, the big driver of this number is, uh, you'll see it on your spreadsheet, it's the sludge tons. And that is a big number because we have to pay Casella to remove it after it's done. And if I look at those numbers, we have a hundred and a hundred and eighteen ton increase in the sludge solids that had to be removed between that time period in eighteen and that time period in nineteen, which is a hundred and twenty two percent increase over what we did the prior year. And that netted about 12,000, the 12,231 number, which is highlighted on the spreadsheet. The other costs that make up that 17,000, again, are soft costs, the polymer, the odor control, for our processing costs that we can allocate per ton, but we don't really know which, t where the line is in the ton allocation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. How many are the towns? How many are theirs? We know roughly, but we don't know exactly where that is. So then, in also, you have the letter that was that came in from Wind River when this um, took place, and you know we have their estimate of the volumes that were coming in, what they proposed to pay for a rate. Um, and we have the, their assumption is that we would likely, uh, this rate will cover any 
additional sludge disposal costs that are there. Well, we know that that didn't happen too. Um, but I don't think it's because anybody did anything you know, to be deceptive here. I just think that's the reality of it. But at the bottom, <coughs> there's some calculations that were done by Wind River. And remember, this was when the discussions were about Wind River having a disposal, there was a fee attached to it, but in exchange they could do a certain element of work that they do for the town anyway and net that out towards this fee. So this has some netting in there. But at the very bottom we see that there, there's some conversation about um, them paying a monthly amount and then truing up at some point. And that monthly amount only comes to 32000 when they were assuming the amount was 64000 So the numbers are all over the place in this, but there's truly an intent there at some point to screw this up. Um, and, but I'm not, what's unclear is whether the truing up is to the 64000 that's mentioned in the letter, since the amount they want to pay monthly is only half of what the what the amount is they suggest, or whether it's a truing up mm. the actual costs. And you know, and our there's a sample of the minutes, and the minutes are the you know, yes, we talked about this, so we aren't getting any help whatsoever out of the committee minutes. But you also have a email chain where the proposal came in in August from the river. And you see in November, Suzanne is poking Chris to say, um, you know, we kind of got stuck in the details. Do we separate the two? So we'll bill you for the services we provide. You bill us for the services we provide. Um, but, you know, what needs to happen so we can move forward with this eight and a half cent agreement? And Chris's response, you know, is I kind of lost track of this. Basically, we talked, and then I forget where we left it. But if you guys are ready to start a trial run, I feel as though we are too. Thank you. Anytime after the first of the year works for us. So it's it's really clear to me that this is trial. This is we're attempting to get the best price we can figured out. And we actually looked at the numbers that Chris used to kind of check this. And Chris's numbers were dead on. If you used the, the um, amount of solids, the, what the volume, the percentage of solid, whatever it is, you, however the measurement is, mm -hmm. because he used the measurement that's our product. So our product, say, is value one, and, and I think it's like 1.6 or 1 point something, and theirs coming in is, was closer to nine. And so if you took the value that Chris calculated, he was spot on for what it cost us to produce or to process All a right. gallon of our right. product at the concentration level it was there. Where he, what he missed was multiplying it by the difference, right, of the, of the, the, concentration. the concentration. And had he done that, he would have been pretty close. He would have been a little higher, actually, than what the actual cost was. So, you know, you take a guy whose background is in finance, and I think that somehow we got into this situation we were in. We didn't, we don't track our numbers this way. We don't come up with this value because we're not in the market not for business, no, no. doing this. And and I think he did the best he can. But I think also our number is a little bit hard if we said, well, we just want to break even on this. I'm not sure the 17 is the right number either. But I don't know how we get to what that number is. I do though believe that we can say it's very easily at least 12,000, the difference, right? Because we know that we have this much higher concentration coming in and we have to dispose of it in the end after it goes through the process. And that has a fee to it and it's, you know, we, we can see that we went up 122% in our solids that we had to dispose of. So. I go back to the Water Wastewater Committee's recommendation of the 2575, but I think the fair way to do it is to flip it. I think that the, the it's after you get the numbers and after you look at the documentation and whatnot that it's.
pretty easy to see that the, the costs that drove the higher amount are in a direct correlation to the product that was coming in and not the product that we were producing there. And, you know, I don't know how we can get to the exact down to the penny what that cost is, and I don't think we can at this point. And I think we have some of this. Some of this is ours. We didn't give Chris the support he needed to be able to calculus, calculate this rate. And, you know, unfortunately, the staff that he had to work at the time, they didn't have a good relationship. And, and it is what it is, and we're where we are today. But I, don't, I think the fair, when I went through all this and I kept looking at it, I think that maybe it's fair split, but I think a split has to go the opposite with what the Water Wastewater Committee's recommendation was. That's kind of where I come down on tonight. Work with Cliff to get some of this paperwork together so that you can see the. This is about what we have for information to go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could support that. It's a tough. It's a lot better than what we had last week or last month. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we get a lot more information now. So. In the end, um, if you look at the numbers, the amount that was originally invoiced to them was, was before the numbers got sharpened. And what we're looking at now, if we go with a 12000 and change, they're getting about half of it back. Mm -hmm. right. But some of it would, we've already advised them, some of it was coming back to them mm -hmm. where sure. the number was incorrect the first time. Right. That's the 6400 that's in here? That's right. Yeah. yeah. to be the number that's highlighted on the spreadsheet is just showing that that's the difference in pro in the um, disposal of the end product right with that in 122 percent increase in in that volume over the course of the same time period so that number isn't the actual <clears throat> cost that's ab above what we expected it to be for yeah. this disposal? Um, no, because we never calculated what that would be. Oh, because we never, because Chris never figured out the, what the difference would actually be for this. Right. And I don't know that so. he ever had values, right? So he didn't have he knew what was what they were proposing to come in, but I don't know that he ever knew, given the density of what was coming in, what that volume would be on the other end to have calculated that. Can I interject now? Is that is that time passed? No, you no, no. just a second. But did, so when I had that conversation with, with him and Cliff, uh, it, it appeared that, you know, a lot of this was trial, and it's in the documentation kind of supports that. Mm -hmm. You know, we're really, we have this new technology, we believe we can benefit. There actually is statements in here where they thought bringing this in was going to reduce the cost to producing all, to processing all the rest of it. So there would be a cost savings on the stuff that normally was coming through versus mm -hmm. by bringing this in. And we actually ended up with the reverse, which right. is why you do a trial <clears throat> to some extent. We just have learned a valuable lesson that we want to define it up a lot better before we try a trial again. But, so, did you want to share some more? No, yeah, my, yeah, my only, uh, my only objection being when the email chain where we were discussing the trial. Um, I was I was part of that discussion as well. It was more of a trial to see if the equipment could actually handle the material. You know, you know what I mean. It was based on seeing if it could actually 
you know, process the material, how it was actually going to work for them. Um, and also, the, the thickness, the, the material that was coming to Chris, he already, he already knew what the, the projected thickness of the material would be. We had provided him with that information as well. So you provide him with what the volume was going to be after it ran through the equipment? What his, the what his solids would be after it went through the centrifuge? That, that conversation I was not a part of. That's where the driving cost is. Correct. It's clear that that's where the the, the biggest, disposal, the disposal, the disposal is the correct. biggest cost that, that basically blew this number right. out of the water. Yeah, I just I just wanted to you know make sure everybody's. Yeah, and there, I mean there's there's talk about crewing up. There's <coughs> the only problem is. You know, we could build a case that it was truing up to the cost. You could build a case that it was truing up to the, the, the volume or the, the thing. Volume. You know, it's the problem is nowhere did we ever take all this and capture it into one and there document wasn't an and contract. say, okay, this is how it's going to work, and here's where we're, we're going to check in and whatnot at all. So it all folds down to a series of documents that an email probably Correct. a court <laughs> would have a field day. Right. So on how do sides. you then try to look at the fair way to resolve it and I, go forward? And I would think it, at the at the heart of it all, you know, even as as everybody has spoken about earlier, I mean, it's a it's a business decision that that was made on both both sides to try and benefit both sides equally. Um, I mean, I think at, at worst it would be a 50-50, you know, take on the the responsibility. So if you you paid us twenty four thousand, we give you back both from the fixing of the numbers and the adjustment twelve of that. Do you think I mean, I personally is a think, fair number? You know, I would I would prefer it to be seventy five, twenty five in our favor, but I honestly think fifty fifty is fair. <laughs> Just to be realistic. We would prefer a zero one hundred. Right, no. <laughs> 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 right. I mean, we would I, need I, it in our favor, just to be clear. Right. <laughs> but I mean, in all, all fairness, I mean, it's, it's something that on both sides, both of us ventured into, you know, with, with good intentions, yeah, trying to benefit yeah. both the town. And yeah, nobody was. Us. There's no no ill intention here. So, you didn't think the fifty fifty split was fair? We had the water sewer committee meeting. Well, I, I definitely would prefer that it be well, 75 my, 25. Well, I know. Well, that's that's clear. But, I, but <laughs> my recollection was that you also thought that that was fair and that a 50 50 split was, was not, was like, not, was was not, not fair. Right, correct. Yeah. But now he's changed his mind. I'm, I'm, you could, people are allowed to change their mind. I'm just pointing out that that seems okay. to be what's happening here. Yeah, well, it's okay. Can you change yours right? too? I'm sorry? You changed yours too? Um, I, I could be okay with the 50 50 split. Okay. Okay, so are we doing 50 so, 50 of the original well, number or 50 50 of the 17 9? Because my numbers in looking at this, what they should have ended up paying is about 12,000. Yeah, I believe we already did get an adjustment from what the original number was. Yeah, we refunded 6,400. So right now we're saying that the total additional cost to the t to the town was at least twelve thousand dollars. Was seventeen thousand nine thirty. We're, se we're still saying that that's seven it's seventeen thousand. Okay. So. That's yeah. So. And we so refunded the six to get down right, to twelve. Right. Yes. So we're talking about right now either. 50 split, 50 split, which is about $9,000, or going with this, about $12,000. I believe the, 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 the change in the, the 6000 refund was based on the fact that the original numbers were accrued from a 9% of solids, and that the solids were actually only in the, in the realm of six. Yeah, no, I, we, we, I think we were all pretty clear that that was a, an error, and that, that 6000 was 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 given as a right. as as a as a a refund that was based upon yeah we're fixing that mistake right. that everybody agrees was made yeah and just so you know we 
sat down, we took the numbers from there, and we ended up, we analyzed them three different ways, and mm -hmm. we came out right about at the same number each mm -hmm. time we did it to mm -hmm. make sure that we were we were capturing everything and we were looking at it fairly. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the challenge we have is we don't know what the normal flow into the system without produced, the additional and stuff then and then right. Mm -hmm. So we can't run them both independently right, to right. see what that cost would have been, mm -hmm. which is part of where the we tried to figure out if we could come up with even assumptions that we didn't have enough data to do that. Right. What do you want to do? So you're asking 50% of the 17 or 15% of the 12? Is that what you're asking? Um, the 17.9. Yeah, so the amount is 17,900. So the question on the table is how we split that to make it right. I'm in favor of the, of the half town, half, half on them, out of the 17.9. I'm fine with that, so go for it. Make the motion. I'll second it. <laughs> All right. So 50% of the overage would be the town's responsibility, and 50% would be Wind River's responsibility of the 17.9 total cost for the additional product that we've been moving through. That's the motion. You're if you the exact numbers, right? So we would be providing them an additional refund of $8,969.67. There you go. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carried. Did you get the number? Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I see you're right. <laughs> and going forward, we have a new formula, correct? <laughs> uh, going forward, we have to take on the finance okay. staff person. That's Gonna work that on that. Chris Are we doing a contract? contract? <laughs> we have not. We don't have a signed contract at this point, but we have agreed to a set price with a sliding scale based on the percent solids. So we're in good. a single document. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It'll read with laughs> yeah. All I want to hear is the financial guys working on it, and everybody yeah. seems to be chatting about it. So sounds like we're in good shape. Yeah, and we, the spreadsheet has, I don't know how many pages to it. Um, sure. Through the numbers um, to... I bet it's quite complex. Ways. There's lots of pieces in that deal. Yeah. Well, you're on the water skirt. That's right. It's a numbers <laughs> game. <laughs> okay. All right. Appointments. We have two committees with appointments to talk about tonight. Let's start with the Arts and Culture Committee. So if I, if I could also uh, mention to the, the board, we would also like the board to consider appoint, making appointments, although it's not on your in your packet, but making appointments to the position of zoning administrator and deputy zoning administrator per a decision made by the planning commission earlier this week. Um, so we have a discussion last time on the Arts and Culture Council. was on the number. You were going to go back and have some conversation about right. did we stick with a lower number? The, the takeaway from the last meeting was that the sense of, of a select board, as was expressed going all the way back to the July meeting, was that nine seemed like a, an appropriate number. Uh, and over the course of the last couple of months, uh, Sonny Holt and Suzanne, Susanna Gravel uh, and I had actually found 14 people, the three of us included, who were interested in potentially being on uh, the committee. At the direction of the select board last, at last month's meeting, we then went back to those 14, explained the process that you had laid out to get a name to the committee, and um, several people 
hold their names to consideration, citing time constraints uh, primarily uh, in terms of serving. Uh, and uh, at the request of the select board, we solicited biographies and statements of interest from the remaining people who remain interested in being appointed to the committee. And those names were submitted, and bios were submitted to Adolfo and Shen uh, by the October 4th deadline of last Friday. Uh, and uh, the following people. Uh, Phyllis Forbes, Karen Dillon, Dave Hurwitz, Vincent Freeman, Andrew uh, Mueller, Chris Wilson, and Marjorie Ryerson all submitted statements of interest in bios. Uh, that's seven people for the six remaining slots, as best I understand. We're going to make our job difficult, right? So now we got to eliminate one. Adolfo had a, uh, he might chat about this. You got a recommended list? There was no recommended list uh, submitted by the committee, but if the board would like, it, it could it could make its decision based on uh, when the statements of interest were received by by Tom were submitted to the town. We also have two sculptors, right? So you can do it by their. You can do it by profession. My, you know, there's there's a variety of, of, of artists. We have uh, poets. We have. Uh, Sculptors, we have music uh, producers, and so performing painters, arts performing presenters, arts. Yeah. we have uh, uh, fine woodworkers, mm -hmm. uh, we have an instrument maker who is also a musician. Uh, who's the second sculptor? Who's on the back here? Chris. We have Chris Wilson oh, and David. David is listed as a sculptor as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although he's primarily he's known as a yeah, well, would work. Right. What um, does Phyllis do? Phyllis is um, more a patron of the arts than an artist herself, and she will readily, um, readily speak to that. Um, I believe that she I also the was it. the, if, if you had, as Adolfo had suggested, if you were to um, work based on the order of the submissions of the statements that came in, Phyllis's was the last statement to come forward. Uh, we had discussed the possibility of having alternates to this committee so yeah. that people could feel like they belonged and they Still were officially part of the committee and even though they wouldn't get to vote if they if, the, if everyone was there, we could point them all on Clifford as an alternate. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? You got your hand up. Yeah, does that, yeah. does that sound yeah. reasonable? And, and, and it, in that way, if one of the original nine were to step down, perhaps it would, she would just step in. She would step in. She would just step in. And I think she would be absolutely fine with that. When I last conversed with her uh, uh, on the day she submitted her um, statement of interest last Friday, she expressed some mild concern that she was the only non-artist of the group and also indicated that um, she and her husband were going to be out of town for the first meeting or two. Uh, so, so, so alternate um, work, there you go. Yeah, I, think, uh, I think she would be more than, um, more than happy to function in that alternate role and if one of the original nine does step down over the course of the next year, she could just step into that. Uh, if that's the if that's the setting of the select board. Perfect. So I'll make a motion that we take the slate of folks that have expressed interest and nominate them to the Arts Council and make Phyllis Forbes the alternate. Second. Aye. 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 Just one other piece of information. We have um, tentatively agreed that we will be meeting on the first Tuesday um, of each month at a time to be determined and Presumably, pending confirmation with Karen Dillon, will be meeting each um, each month at Chandler. So. There are some really good ideas already coming out of this committee. Um, they're also going to be participating in the chairs group. So hopefully, as the chairs all start communicating with one another, <coughs> there could be some some um, 
I guess, cross pollination between yeah. the committees. I think there's tremendous possibilities yeah. for cross pollination with this group and recreation, for example. There's already a little of that going development. on. Development, mm -hmm. it's really, yeah. it really crosses a lot of lines. Some of that happening already. Did we get additional people through our advertising? None through our advertising. Mm -hmm. We put it uh, in the Herald and then also posted notices in the general stores, but none. No. Well, they've thought of everybody. <laughs> I think they got them all, Pat. They got them all. <laughs> we cornered all the interest. Anybody that wants to devote time, I'm still looking for a listener, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Really that. Jumping into that one, huh? Nobody wants to jump into that one. I can't Thank understand you, why. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. I'm not sure if it'll, well, I wasn't sure if it'll help the board. I know I'm not sure if Sonny's going to leave, but Sonny's the chair of the planning commission, and I wasn't sure if the board would like to consider the zoning or the deputy zoning position in case Sonny uh, Sonny is to leave at this point. So we've got two more, two more. To, to do, but we can go to. Um, with the zoning, with the departure of Marty, it left the opening. We've advertised and not got any rock stars. So the proposal that was submitted to the Planning Commission that they voted to support was to make Josh the zoning administrator and Adolfo the backup, second assistant, whatever you call him. Deputy. Yeah. He's the deputy. Um, that gives us a few things, right? Mm -hmm. So it gives us a full-time position that's here when people come in. So there's always somebody that folks can talk to. Um, and the backup being full-time also, they ought to be able to find at least one of you. Mm -hmm. And then that leaves us um, finding them some, Josh, some administrative help and he has a larger project that comes through the door. Or to we, we also agreed to hire a part-time ZA administrative assistant uh, to fill not Marty's position because that has already been filled by Josh, but to help out with the uh, specifics, you know, uh, issuing the permits and so forth, all of the details that she would uh, take into account. Finaling administrative stuff. We mm -hmm. talked about all that. So this position would be primarily for zoning, so all the permits would we have a person continuously producing the permits as needed. We would have, like Trini mentioned, someone here full time to be able to answer all zoning questions, or at the very least, provide some support to the community as they come in. Um, and there may be potential need in the future for our finance department for some additional support. The zoning administrator, when they are available, could also support. Uh, the finance department. You mean the zoning the administrative, administrative the zone, assistant? I'm sorry, yes, yeah, the zoning administrative assistant. So you have, do you have, a, do you have a sense of how many hours per week Josh would be devoting to, to this in this role? Uh, the biggest chunk of time is in actually producing uh, the work and uh, going through the, the paperwork. Um, the actual learning of the zoning administrative uh, duties uh, or the actual permits is it would take some time, but once, you know, I've been doing it now since Marty departed, and I'm already, for the most part, up to speed on, on everything. Yeah, I'm just on, on an ongoing basis, once you've ramped up your your, your, your knowledge of the position. Yeah, on an ongoing basis, it, it shouldn't take any more than, you know, uh, I'd be surprised if it took 30 minutes or an hour every day. Um, now, it could take a little bit more than that if we have a continuous stream of people coming in to ask questions about zoning permits, locations, looking up maps. If that were to ever happen, you know, Josh and I are here. We can both split split the, the steady flow of people coming in. And there is some seasonality to it, too. A lot of it is simple. In single is. family homes, an right. additional mm -hmm. home, they, they can issue the permit. It's when you get a big one like the Gifford development or an expansion at Gifford, those take a little more time. Mm -hmm. Right. Things that have to go in front of the DRB require a little bit more paperwork. And then, and then, does that include the time for the administrative assistant, or is that person sus? Is that a separate amount of time that you would expect that person to spend? We would expect that person would hire them twenty to twenty-five hours a week, depending on you know um, whether they come in, say they'd like twenty or twenty-five, and if it's the right person to do the job. Um, that person, because you know, it may not take twenty hours a week to do all the permits that are available. We could find 
that other departments could, could use some help. So mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it frees us up to be able to provide more support with, with less. And we also are, the biggest issue is making sure that we have answers for constituents or for residents as they come in. Mm -hmm. um, because if we were to hire somebody just part time, um, even though our documents say call ahead or schedule an appointment, you know, I, I've had to deal with people coming in at all hours of the day, they trickle in. And so um, the hours do fluctuate. So even for the administrative assistant, it really would be feast or famine with the permits as they come in. But it does give us the leeway of being able to provide support to the clerk's office, to the finance department. Some of Josh's other activities that he could use. Exactly. Mm -hmm. the to other this time up. But we also have, it is about half of a position. Like Smarty worked three quarters of a position. Mm -hmm. She also did the engineer study, the signs. Yeah. yeah so you had Marty's, Marty's position part time. You have Wendy who's now left, so finance hasn't replaced her. Right. Mm -hmm. So the conversation was is, you know, if you utilize this person in both areas to do the administrative stuff, you could have it, a full time. It seems like, yeah, it could develop into, you know, a pretty strong part time. Mm -hmm. So that was the conversation with the Planning Commission. It would, be, it would be solving problems that currently exist, providing support to other departments while also reducing costs. Yeah. So you're proposing this as a permanent solution? Yes. It, the one, one added benefit is that both Josh and I should be as well versed in the land use regulations and the policies of the town as possible. And I've gone up to speed on the regulations. <coughs> Josh, because of his duty, should also be aware of, as he's working with businesses, to say, okay, yeah, you're best that. suited for this location, you're best suited for over here. Um, and if there are issues that exist with our existing land use regulations, which the Planning Commission has already identified and is working to, to resolve, it would benefit that both the town manager and the economic development director are, are understanding of what those issues are are working with the, the committee that's working to make those changes and then providing recommendations on ways to improve the process. This is, this, this is one of the charges that I believe this board and the Economic Development Committee had for the Econo Economic Development Director, which is review the land use regulations, make changes if possible, and this way it will, it will allow us to do all of that. Yeah. And one of the frustrating things for me as an applicant and came out in the R3 process is, is that you know, if you come in here and you don't find, you didn't find Marty and you had a window of opportunity to get something done and you needed to get approval from police, fire or whatever, you know, you could end up missing a meeting and then you get delayed another month. Right. And that was a real frustrating thing for myself and other people that I know have been in this situation yeah, because you don't get, you know, you don't have anybody here that's from here from eight to noon or whatever. So, you know, you come walking in looking for to get information and to get on that agenda, and you miss it by a couple of days because nobody's here that can help you. Pretty frustrating process, and I watched yeah. it happen numerous times. Yeah. yeah. So. Does Josh know anything about zoning at this point? I mean, is he he's had knowledgeable experience. about zoning itself? He is. He's had experience with his previous positions. He um, he's, he doesn't come to us with you know years of zoning experience, but he does have experience in his previous jobs with recruiting businesses, ensuring that they are complying with regulations. He worked to manage the downtown designation program for Barry. Um, so and that requires a considerable knowledge of, of zoning and where businesses can and cannot go. So he does have experience. Uh, in the interim, while he becomes more familiar with Randolph's land use regulations, I've been working on it um, and will both train him and also educate him on what changes have happened, what the land use regulations are that exist, um, and I'll remain hands on until he's up to speed on everyone. And we do have members of the DRB you can tap whenever you need to because they're all familiar with this stuff in mm -hmm. the Planning Commission. So. We're rewriting it all the time anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but there's more things to tweak. Anybody ready for a decision on that one? Sure. I'm going to make a motion that we would uh, appoint Josh as a zoning administrator and Adolfo as deputy as zoning administrator and give Adolfo the authority to look for a administrative assistant to support that position and whatever else they need for 
support, financial or otherwise. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Discussion. Aye. Or, oh. Some discussion. Can we discussion before we vote? Well, we just voted, but go ahead and discuss. <laughs> well, that's why I tried to say something. <laughs> Don't we usually have discussion? No. I thought we had oh, we discussion. Just <laughs> we just did. We just did. Not when there was a motion on the floor. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Well, the motion's been decided, but go ahead. <laughs> okay, that's really what I wanted to do anyway. Um, to say I don't think I think that was a temporary solution, but I don't think it's a good um, full-time permanent solution for the town. What do you see the challenges as? Well, we needed a full-time economic development director, and now we don't apparently, because he's going to be doing other things part of the time. I think you need somebody that's quite knowledgeable at zoning long term. Um, Nobody's I, applied that. No, I doesn't mean they won't in a week or a month or whatever. I, like I said, I well, see so it as a like temporary. So would you like to continue advertising and see what happens and call this a temporary solution? That would be what I would say it would work well as. But, do, you, I mean, do you see maybe um, the opportunity for this assistant that they're talking about taking on some of the um, duties of the economic development that Josh wouldn't have to then do, which would free him up that time to take on additional responsibilities. It's possible. I don't know how that would work. <clears throat> yeah. That, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. So I'm a no. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. The next appointments are on the fire review committee. Did you vote for that? No. Yep. Um, fire review committee we set up last time. Um, there's an action sheet. We have gotten names from each of the fire departments and the town of Braintree. And we have identified one community member so far. Um, the community member that has been identified is Kevin O'Donoghue. Um, he is a longtime firefighter with New York City, uh, but he was involved in helping the town write part of our emergency response plan. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Um, and he has uh, experience. I, I had quite a lengthy discussion with him. Um, he has experience looking at uh, efficiencies and have the right term but um, how you do mutual aid and backup for even <coughs> single departments that have multiple locations um, and he admits that the response in New York City is a different model than in the rural area but some of the work he's done since he retired and moved to Vermont is more in the rural oh, good. fire stuff so definitely got the impression he was going to bring energy to it it's a passion of his um, cool. but also that he was coming at it with the realistic view that we didn't need New York City firefighting in France. Good, because I don't want to run skyscrapers there. <laughs> <laughs> with a I'm good for four floors. <laughs> okay. Don't need extra training. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but we're still looking for two more community members that have some background in this. Um, but tonight we're looking to get this list um, appointed and that will give us enough members to get started on this fun adventure. Yeah, and just I think I mentioned you from the fire advisory meeting I attended the other night. They're just looking for when do do we think as select board that this will you know, is it November, December, that would, January, what's our goal for getting this started? I think once we get this approved and we get people appointed then it's up to you and I to figure out when okay. We pump this Not and we kick this off. <laughs> and how we do it, right? So, right. any questions on the cast? No, nope, I think you need to get that moving right along. Thanks. The sooner the better. Thanks. <laughs> That's what I said. You need to get that moving right along. Did you say who Dave Burson is? He is an alternate that's been selected by the town of Raintree. We're not going to 
not questioning their appointment. We didn't question it. No, I just wondered if anybody knew who he was. I don't know who he is. Mm -hmm. I don't know him, but came from them, so. He's not their member of the fire advisor, either. He's not a member of the fire department, either. Maybe he's got worldly fire experience. Who an knows? Yeah. I don't recognize the name. Yeah, I would. Nobody I know, so. That one's for you fire guys. Need a motion to Okay, I'll move that. I'll make the motion to approve the uh, selected members, or the proposed members for the fire review committee. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Discussion of town clerk, town treasurer, list of positions. So we've been working with uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, who's helped us to obtain a considerable amount of information on uh, the transfer from an appointed lister clerk treasurer to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, an elected lister clerk treasurer positions to appointed. Um, BLCT was uh, uh, also kind enough to send out a list to their entire listserv and we received responses from towns, each sharing their experiences <coughs> varying from, we tried this, they went up for a vote and the voters voted to keep them elected, to we put this up for a vote at town meeting and the voters appreciated it because now we can hire professionals at each one of these positions as opposed to relying on qualified people to run for office. Um, so I, I think at this point, just given the timeline that we have for creating the warrant, uh, which is should be done by early to mid-January of next year, I would like to, to share with the board that we had a, um, we have a currently a loose plan to start uh, an education campaign to have public meetings, invite residents to come to town hall for a publicly warned meeting or discussion to share with them the proposal, why we would like to potentially have these currently elected positions become appointed, have members of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns present so they could answer questions of the benefits that come with um, either one style, but also some of the successes that have come from other towns that have really nightmare stories from towns that have had elected people that didn't perform the job um, and the changes that have happened uh, when these positions were changed to appointed uh, by the board and hired and now they, they're, they're professionals filling these roles. Um, so. so we have um, Joyce in until 2021, right? So that one isn't as urgent as the challenges in the Lister's office. Th that is, yes, uh, but Joyce has also expressed an interest to potentially retire sooner, which would put her retirement potentially before the end of her term in 2021. Um, which could leave us in a position where we don't have someone in that position. The board could potentially appoint someone to fill that elected position, but... Um, but the issue of, so when we, the information we got from the league was if we, that she shared with us was that if we voted at town meeting day this mm -hmm. March, then what was it, 45, 45 days, days later, the position's gone. That's right. Whereas if she was gonna stay to the end of her term, we would want to take that into consideration as far as and potentially not vote on it till the following year. We could do that. But if she's now talking about retiring before her term's over, it's just a timing question of it is. of you know when does it go on the ballot? When is the when are we faced with the issue? Yeah. I did share with her. We did. We, we talked to timeline. She did not confirm that yes, she's retiring sooner. No, she's not going to finish her term, but. She politely nudged me in the direction of, you know, I'd like to retire. I may retire sooner rather than later. Maybe the board could do it this time around, and then it could appoint her until she finishes a role, and then hire someone new, or, you know, we could do it next town meeting in 2021. I think it fail safe is you do it now, 
Well, at least you included in the discussion, right? Included yeah. in the discussion, and, and if it's you a no action. Yeah, you maybe, maybe take no action, but if you do it now, then then the pressure is off to her for her to make a decision based on where we're at. So I think she's a very dedicated town clerk, and mm -hmm. so I don't think that you know if you gave her the easy out, maybe she would go early. So. But I'd hate to think that she maybe was. Maybe we don't do it, and then we guarantee we have her till the end of. Yeah, yeah, well, that's the other side of this. It's like, okay, we get to keep her, but <laughs> but you know, she could. We want to do a return for Joyce with best interest of the town. Just, I mean, there's uh, a conflict here. There's a conflict, yeah. We're but, actually but, here for this. Uh, you know, there's needs here that have to be met, and uh, so you know, if she's indicating to you that she's leaning in that direction, you know, Ed was said he was going to be here for another year, and he disappeared. Mm -hmm. So you know, I'm just looking at what the reality is. Yeah. So, you know, I would rather be more proactive than reactive. Yeah. When, when we had the Joyce here to discuss some of this with us, she seemed to indicate, and I don't really remember what her reasonings were, so maybe somebody could remind me, but she seemed to indicate that the town treasurer position would be a good one to, to have be part of the finance office and not have it be an elected position. She seemed to think that keeping the town clerk as an elected position was a good idea. And I'm, I'm wondering if we should have a discussion around that and see if, if you know, what we feel about it, you mm -hmm. know, taking into account what, what, what Joyce's thoughts are and, um, and, and what our response is before we decide to put that up for a town-wide vote. You know, I think we definitely need to have the conversations. Absolutely. I think some of her conversation with that was what the... What the the level of the responsibility yeah. and the skills needed to do it, that the finance side of it required a higher level of skill that may be harder to find somebody willing to run for and could come into that. But she was saying that a lot of the duties in the clerk's office weren't, didn't fall into that. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure why the appointed See, versus elected. Yeah, I mean, thing, is it, it's that, worth asking. I do remember her seeming to think that. Having the the town clerk's office being independent was oh, a good finance. thing. That there was, you know, that there was something, you know, positive about that for the town. Um, but I, I couldn't tell you what specifically why why she was thinking that that was true. So if the board would like, we could. So I had an initial initial plan of potentially starting. Uh, public conversations, we wouldn't want to call them public meetings, but the public conversations maybe late this month, November, December, and if a fourth uh, conversation was necessary, one in January. But if, if the board would like to hear from Joyce, if I could invite her to come to the next select board meeting, we could still have two or three public conversations between now and mid-January. Um, and this way the board can then hear from Joyce directly on her reasoning for uh, an appointed treasurer and an elected clerk, or vice versa. So th there are some time constraints, but they're not very crucial at this point. Mm -hmm. There's still time to to mm -hmm. advertise public public meetings. We could we could advertise a meeting to discuss this without action without committing ourselves to any particular course of action at mm -hmm. this point. And I think that's what we gotta do, right? Because we right. gotta convince the taxpayer, we gotta educate the taxpayers so they can make their decision no, no, or vote. Educate yeah, us. yeah, yeah, but like, <laughs> but when like it comes we could... to posing the question on the ballot, we're gonna be saying, we're basically gonna be saying, do you, do you vote to approve? Mm -hmm. You know, moving this to an right an appointed versus elected position, or right? But I guess what I'm saying, just in the interest of moving forward, we could say, yeah, let's go ahead with the public meetings. And in the course of them, we might, you know, the five of us might come to a consensus. We're like, you know, we really think that keeping the town clerk as a elected position is a good idea. And so we don't even put it on the ballot, even though we had had it up for discussion mm -hmm. in the public forum. Right, I agree. I think there's a little fact-finding thing going on here. All these positions, you know, have evolved and become more complex and complicated than they were 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more regulation. There's a lot more oversight. So I think, you know, the town clerk in Stratford has probably got a different role than the town clerk in Randolph. And mm -hmm. the one in Randolph's got a different role than the one in Rockland or whatever. So yep. I think it's, as a community, I think we're, you know, moving beyond some of these things. 
So. And I can't imagine that the regulation coming down from the state is going to get less. No, I don't, I don't believe it <laughs> for one second. <laughs> On the listener's office, if you could find somebody that would be interested in what um, Ed was doing with that, or you have any interest in looking for that? Or having Recruiting to, to fill the... It has been very trying to, to find someone to appoint. I know that we had... We spent some time trying to convince our... Who, who was our second lister, Dennis, to be appointed and you know, Dennis agreed to help us out, and that was, I think, mostly driven by the town's need to have two listers in order to submit the <coughs> paperwork to the state so that they could they could accept it. Uh, if we were not able to find Dennis, and we tried to find somebody to fill that position for months, uh, we would not have been able to submit the proper paperwork to the state so that they could confirm our real estate numbers. But I'm just saying, say there was somebody that was interested. Are you still open to that possibility or do you just want to do it? Oh, I think it's up to the board. I, you know, I think the position is open and I, I know Ed, I mean, I'm sorry, I know Dennis, Dennis is working as hard as he can and could use the help, but it really would be up to the board. Are you saying would the discussion of what to do with a listener's office be done if we found a replacement for Ed? I guess what's the, yeah, would that satisfy the need or is it still you want to have that discussion? I still think well, we need to have a three. discussion because right. we, and we only have one. And you're not str we're not finding anybody. I mean, I twisted Dennis's arm pretty hard well, he's, to, to get he's him to help. Retired, basically. Yeah, he yeah. is, and that, and that was that was it. And he said, "Yeah, I'll, I can help out the community, but I just, you know, it's like I'm not going to do this forever." Right. You, you know, so a younger person. Yeah, and when you look around and say, "Okay, who's the pool of people that could have qualifications to do this?" It's becoming a struggle, and it's not just us. I mean, this is happening statewide, oh, and we heard that from the tax department that you know, we're the only state in the union that has listers, and so you mm -hmm. know. It's another one of those. Okay, should we should be gravitating to a different system, yeah. but that's going to be a hard sell because you know rural Vermont thinks uh, we've got to have elected, elected listers. If we I are, I think having a replacement for Ed, maybe the, the question is, is that really a long term solution? That's what I asked. Right, yeah. and I don't know that, and I think that's the discussion that has to take place in the education process, and let the voters decide which way they come down on the topic. I have received confirmation from our current and only lister that he would he would probably resign the position by mid next year. Um, so even if we were to solve the issue now of appointing somebody to fill the vacancy that Ed left, um, we probably would be in the same situation as soon as Dennis chose to resign his position mid next year. Yeah. So I think they have to be. And that's not a position that's getting any easier either. No, it's not. And it's, it's passing said, so of X60 and all that. It right. So it's really ramped it up. Got to be kind of proactive and get a lot more information to figure out what's the direction to take here. Because I, I don't see it like solving itself and three people walk through the door and say, oh, yeah, I want to be listed. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. So. Mm -hmm. So we want to go forward with yeah, the I would. I mean, I think we should. I think we should schedule meetings and start having a conversation. Okay. You think so, Matt? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I'll send a few dates around, uh, but I don't think it would require. Well, if three members of the board do a time, then we would. Then you have to warn it. We have to warn it. So I'll, I'll send some dates around. I'll volunteer out to go. Yeah, I'll hang out. <laughs> I'll alternate. You know, I mean, I'm more than happy to go to some. I just, you know, but we just need to have informal conversations. Yeah. I mean, I can come to one or two. I don't have to go to all of them. Okay. I'll send some proposed dates around, and then if there are any issues with those dates, then it, it, if there are more than three members of the board that do choose to attend any one of the, the conversations, then I'll warn them as a public meeting. They're going to be warned anyway, so. Yeah. They're going to be warned, but. So, okay. All right. Other business. I have a short report. Feeling uh, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Been a rough. <laughs> um, I, I will. I will keep it brief. I know I said that last time, and it took a little longer than expected. Um, 
I do want to remind the board, I think the board was discussing this as the meeting was started, the Randolph Center Area Fire Association has its meeting scheduled for Monday uh, evening, uh, at which point they will uh, discuss how they would like to proceed with the relationship with the town. Uh, we've had ongoing meetings with the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission is looking to make recommendations for changes to the, uh, continued changes to land use regulation, and then also the sign ordinance. Um, I believe a priority has been set uh, for preference with the land use regulations coming first and the site ordinance uh, uh, being potentially revised immediately after. I have since been in contact with the um, Vermont League of Cities and Towns and they have mentioned that there have been some federal changes that are affecting signs uh, throughout the country and they would like, rather than share changes that other towns have made to their sign ordinances, they want to refer our questions to Municipal Assistance Center attorney so that they can walk us through the process so that any changes that we make to the town's sign ordinance are in compliance with federal law. Um, I think it's just something that happened recently and they want to make sure that we're in compliance just as I'm sure we all want to make sure we're all in compliance. No, um, no. <laughs> it's just absolutely not. I, yeah. <laughs> The Planning Commission recently also heard from a representative from a uh, state agency, and I, uh, the name of the agency eludes me at the moment. I believe it's the Department of Housing and Community it's Development. Under, it's under the, yeah, it's under ACCD. Under ACD. Uh, and the briefing was to discuss a, a, a C program that's similar to the Downtown Designation Program, but is titled the Neighborhood Development Area Designation Program. And what this does is it works with communities that are looking to expand um, housing, in this case workforce housing. So it increases the size of the, the current area of the downtown designation program to approximately about a quarter mile outside. And then this would help towns to identify areas that could be developed for workforce housing or housing to help businesses in, in town. Um, Planning Commission is considering potentially making a recommendation to the select board to apply for this program. We feel it would be beneficial because it, it would encourage uh, developers who want to help the town to bring in workforce housing. It reduces their Active 50 costs, permit requirements, time during the Active 50 process. It still would require these projects to go through Active 50, but it would reduce the costs for developers considerably. So. And it fast tracks some of the some of the process. It fast tracks and eliminates some things that are required. Basically, the concept was as the devil was saying, was to focus on more core. Mm -hmm building more density within the village districts yeah. and it was recommendations about zoning things we already meet some of these things in the last round of zoning we already addressed some of these mm -hmm. things so we're already actually had a little bit of a head start on this absolutely and so we've had some interest from from our economic development partners it's in certain areas in the town that would benefit from this it would make it cheaper for them to perform their work and easier for for us to create density in, in the downtown which would help our businesses and our employers is this, I'm not sure, is this a state program that goes along with village and downtown designation? Yes. Or it's part of that. It's part of that program. Um, is it expand upon the downtown program? Yes, it expands upon the so downtown program. So you're basically being downtown but expanding the area. Exactly. Yep. Uh, we had, during the presentation, we had uh, Julia Flint, who is the director of RACDC in attendance, she was familiar with the old version of this particular program. She learned that the program has changed during the presentation and, and felt that the program is something that could benefit the towns. Um, so, you know, again, there's no decision made by the Planning Commission. It's just something to consider as we move forward. And that is, uh, that is it for our manager report. I know, right? It's record time. <laughs> record time. Thanks, <laughs>